Sometimes I wish I could play like that. I wish I could do that. That fanfare. I, I taught her how to play that. I did. I taught her every twang I know. <laughs> Anyways. Twang! That's why I didn't know any twang until I came down south, and I learned all my twang. And so... It's not a bad thing. In fact, in, in fact, in fact, Matt, this is totally off subject. I don't know how we got here. But anyways, Matt and I on our way down to uh, Mount Vernon, Georgia. Down, Mount Vernon. Now, that's way down south. We saw one of those signs that said, on the church, said that Jesus, he's the real thing. Thang? Thang. It's T-H-A-N-G. He's the real thing. And I said, well, finally, someone's starting to spell it like they talk. Anyways, he's the real thing. So, anyways. We're getting there. I, I called I called Andrew, my southern boy, this morning. And uh, he was having grits for breakfast. And I said, you talk with a draw? And he said, what's that? <laughs> Anyways. He, yeah, he'll get there. Anyways. So, yeah, it's an amazing thing. We have more more grits in my house than mortar in my, my shed. I'm not quite sure that's a good thing. So... We have definitely transitioned here in life. We are in the book of Revelation. What's that? At least you're going to eat. We're going to eat. Amen. And we're going to talk about that this morning. It's probably a good transition, actually, what we're going to talk about. The book of Revelation. And uh, we have been going through this. And a few weeks ago, we began looking at the things that shall be. And um, as we've been considering the things that shall be, uh, last week I felt burdened that before we started getting into the chapter 6, and the detail of the prophetic portion that we needed to look at an overview. And so, um, on the back table, if you weren't here last week, but I, looking out, I think everybody was here last week, um, there are, we, we have some of the colored copies of the, the overview um, that's back there, and so if you need one, please get that. Um, not necessarily that I'm going to follow that each week now, but it helps, to, helps you by looking at that to keep a perspective of where we are in the whole calendar, if you would, the, the, the schedule of, of things going on. And so, we are beginning in chapter 6 now to look at the seal judgments. The seal judgments. And in chapter 6, Daniel read these. We have, there's a lot to cover today. And so, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of fly through some of this stuff. Because as I calculated this this morning, I fly, that's right, I put wings on. I have about 35 slides. So, even if I spend only one minute, I'm wasting my minutes now talking about the slides. If I spend only one minute, it's a 35 minute message. So, Anyway, so I want to move quickly through this stuff. Some of them will be quicker than others, but some of the slides will clearly be taking more than a minute on. So, but in chapter 6, we begin looking at the opening up of the seal judgments. And before we begin looking at each of these seals, the, just an overview, or a real quick introductory thought that I want to point out is that as we look at these first four seals, and then all the seals as a whole, is that Jesus Christ, remember, in the throne room, it's Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, who goes and takes the book with the seals, the scroll with the seals, out of the hand of God. And it is he then, in verse 1, we saw the Lamb open the seals. And so there is an ownership, if you bring this back to your mind, there's an ownership that's going on here, that Jesus Christ is the one who is the, has the authority, has the power to open up these seals. The seals are the sign of authority and ownership. And so, as we begin to see these seals opening, we're going to begin to see the devastation that it causes to the earth. In my mind, very clearly, this is like a mortgage document. This is like an ownership paper where Jesus is declaring that he has ownership over the earth. And as he opens these up and as things begin to happen to the earth, then He's revealing that he has the authority. He is the one who owns. He is the creator. And so we know Psalm 24. The earth is the, the Lord's in the fullness thereof, the world and all who dwell in it. And so, because he, he, he established it. He founded it upon the waters. And that Lord there is Yahweh. And I think, again, Jesus Christ is Yahweh. We know, and we're going to see this, the word of God, in a few moments. But John chapter 1 says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And... Without him, nothing was made that was made, and in him was life, and the life, light, and the light was a life, and the life was the light of men. Anyways, and so Jesus Christ is Yahweh in the flesh. He is the Creator God, and so He has the right, He has the authority to open up these seals of ownership over the earth. And so, as we begin, then looking at these seals opening up, the first four seals all have the same um, 
impact, if you would, they all happen the same way. We're going to see um, a horse, we're going to see a rider, we're going to see a consequence, and then we're going to see what I'm going to at least hopefully have as a slight interpretation of what's going on there. And so on the first seal, it's opened up, and we read and we see that the first seal, um, when the seal is opened up, one of these four living creatures, one of these beasts that were in front of the, the, um, the throne of God, cries out, Come and see! And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. And it's, it's interesting, as far as my, the testimony time, I was going to stand up and give testimony, but it's really part of this. I spent hours this week studying this stuff. And remember I said way back in the beginning of this that I really felt like I never wanted to preach on the book of Revelation because I don't fully understand it. So the, the burden on me going into these, each of these messages to, to understand is so incredible. And, and I'd like to be able to tell you I, I, I've got it all down pat. And I can't tell you that I'm, I'm there. I, I know so much more. Um, I know so much about wheat and barley and everything else now that, that I never knew before. But, um, but it's amazing how many people are debating where this vision even is even occurring. Whether it's actually written on the scroll. And so when he says told to come and see. Whether John is actually looking at the scroll right now and he's seeing a picture of a white horse with a rider on it, or, or whether this is actually a, uh, uh, an animated thing that's going on, or, or what it is. I, I, I'm not quite sure that this was the, the point that I would be debating over. It really doesn't matter to me whether it's written on the scroll or whether it's, he's seeing something visual. I think, literally, that he's seeing the future. So I, I think he's seeing what's happening, but it doesn't matter. But what he sees is, whether it's on the scroll or whether he sees it fully animated and, or fully alive, right, what he sees is, he sees a white horse, first of all, okay? And so we see the horse. The horse is described as white. Now, it's interesting whether this is real, true, or not, however you want to apply this, okay, that a white horse, gen generally speaking, throughout history, has been used as a picture of... Vi Say again? The victor. The victor. Victory. That's exactly right. When a Roman general would come back from war, if he was victorious, they would lead him on a parade, but they would place him upon a white stallion. And so the white horse that's there is, is a sign of victory. Secondly, we see the rider. And from the rider, we see two things about the rider. First of all, he has a bow. Now, he doesn't have a sword. Okay, he has a bow. Now, there's a lot of debate going on about that as well. Um, but as a whole, a bow is a warrior's weapon. Okay, it can be a hunter's weapon as well. Okay, and so um, he is one in the ancient days who would go out and he would be able to what? Shoot at a distance. A sword was always used for what? Close-up battle. Close battle. But the bow was used for distance fighting. Okay? And so, you know, to be able to reach out and to, to touch somebody, if you would, from a distance. Okay? And so he has a bow. And secondly, then, he has given a crown was given to him. Now, there is so much I want to say, and so many things I probably won't say because of time, but one thing I do want to state here, and it maybe tinges more toward the interpretation, but it applies right here, is that is in the traditional pre-tribulational view, okay, which is the Tim LaHaye view that we talked about, the David Jeremiah stuff, and, and, and again, I'm not picking on those guys at all, okay, I love David Jeremiah's teaching, I like Tim LaHaye's teaching, okay, but I just don't see what they see in some of this. They make this guy the Antichrist, that this is Antichrist. And there's a big deal made of now then between the one who's riding here and the one who's riding um, in chapter 19 on a white horse, okay? In chapter 19, we know it's Jesus Christ. He's called the Word of God, and he's carrying a sword, or the sword is proceeding from his, his mouth. But he also, Jesus Christ has in chapter 19, a diadem crown on his head. And they make the big deal about the diadem crown being a real crown, and it's a ruling crown, and it's a crown of power. This guy didn't have that. He only had a Stephanus. It's a fake crown. I have a problem with that. Because the Stephanus is the victor's crown. It is the crown which was given to the, the athletes when they, when they raced in the games and they, and, they, and they did this. Whoever won was given the, the crown. And what... I have even more of a problem with it is, is that you and I are not given a diadem. You and I are given a, a Stephanus. 
Stephanus is, is the basic. So I, there, there are different things that as I studied this and I saw positions and I, and I, and I, and I went deep into their positions to find out why they, I just, I, I cringe and I struggle and I, and I why, why, are we, why are we doing this? Why, why are we making cases over words that aren't there, but not making cases over words that are, I'm going to show you that are there? You know, that, that are important as we come through this. And, it, and it's, it's struggling to me. And so this Stephanus that was given to him. Again, the white horse, sign of victory. A Stephanus, a sign of victory. Okay? So we're given a, it was crowned and given to him. And his purpose, the consequence of this horse, is he went out conquering and to conquer. This is our word for nikos, nikon. Okay? The one who was an overcomer. Um, the one who was a victor. Okay? And so all these words, the white horse, the, the, um, the crown, the Stephanus, and that he is a Nikon, a Nikos, a victor, all have what kind of a symbolism involved? Did you get it yet? Victory. Okay? And so what does it mean? I, I, I don't know. I don't know who he is um, necessarily. But what I can tell you, oh, we're going to save this one for a moment, is that it has something to do with, with victory. I don't know if it's Antichrist. Is it possible? It is possible. And I say that upon the, the basis of Matthew 24. Okay? In Matthew 24, in the beginning, Jesus talks about the end times. And he says in the end times um, that there would be false Christ to appear. And so I think that these are going to be rulers. These are going to be leaders. These are going to be individuals who, who are seeking to bring peace, but they're going to be, or conquer, but they're going to be conquered through peace. Now, in this, Zechariah chapter 1, um, the reason why we're looking at this is because, again, those who like to refer to this as Antichrist himself or to a particular ruler, the question is, what is the horse? And maybe I should have done this when we were talking about the white horse. What is the horse? What is the horse symbolic of? Okay? And what is the rider symbolic of? Well, prophetically, there are other passages that refer to four horses, four chariots with horses. And those are in Zechariah. And so in Zechariah chapter 1, we see in verse 7, it says, On the 24th day of the 11th month, with this, which is the month Shabbat, in the second year of Darius, the word of Yahweh came to Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Edo, the prophet. I saw by night, and behold, a man riding on a red horse, and it stood among the myrtle trees in the hollow. And behind him were horses, red, sorrel, and white. Then I said, My Lord, what are these? So the angel or messenger who talked with me said to me, I will show you what they are. And the man who stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, These are the ones whom Yahweh has sent to walk to and fro throughout the earth. So they answered the angel of Yahweh who stood among the myrtle trees and said, We have walked to and fro through the earth, and behold, the earth is resting quietly. Now, the, the man who's standing in the myr myrtle trees, we're told, is who? The angel of Yahweh who... Theoretically, we see it potentially to be who? Jesus Christ. Now, whether it is or not, we can debate that, okay? But let's assume for a moment maybe it is. It's a manifestation of Jesus Christ, okay? What were the jobs of the four horses and horsemen? To make sure the earth was resting quietly, okay? What were their predominant jobs, okay? To make sure the earth was resting quietly or just to do what? To walk to and fro. They were what? They were messengers. They were deliverers. They were, they were ones who were going out as representatives of, of the king, if you would, okay, to find out. Okay? Zechariah chapter 6, verse 1 to 7. Then I turned and raised my eyes and looked, and behold, four chariots were coming from between two mountains, and the mountains were mountains of bronze. With the first chariot were red horses, with the second chariot black horses, with the third chariot white horses, and with the fourth chariot dappled horses. Kind of interesting, huh? Same colors. Strong steeds. Then I answered and said to the angel who talked with me, What are these, my Lord? And the angel answered and said to me, These are the four spirits of heaven who go out from their station before the Lord of the earth. The one with the black horses is going to the north country, the white are going after them, and the dappled are going toward the south country. Then the strong steeds went out, eager to go, that they might walk to and fro throughout the earth. And, they, and he said, Go, walk to and fro throughout the earth. So they walked to and fro throughout the earth. Again, what were their jobs? Their jobs purely are to go forth as messengers. Okay? Now, they are symbolic, then, of other things. They are not individual. Now, and so I apply this back to 
the Revelation chapter 6, I don't see, Bob doesn't see, each of the writers as a specific individual. I see them as a spiritual writer, an angelic type writer, a spiritual being, who is riding a steed that is symbolic of a time frame or an event of things that are going to happen. Does that make sense? So, for the white horse, and the rider on the white horse, it is clearly going to be a time, in my, yeah, I'm going ahead of myself. Um, it, it is going to be a time where I believe peace is going to come, um, be brought about. I get that from verse 4, where we're going to be looking at a moment, because the, the second rider on the second horse is going to be given the privilege and the authority of taking peace from the world. Okay? And so this first guy is going to come, and he's going to conquer. He's going to have victory. Okay? I say this first guy, but I'm talking about the spiritual being, not an individual. Okay? Now, he could be representing a world leader, or he could be representing a world concept. Okay? Right now, in our, in our culture, um, throughout, we desire to have world peace in a one world government. Now, will it be an Antichrist, who is the, the uh, Secretary General of the United Nations? Will it be an Antichrist who is the President of the United States? Will it be an Antichrist who is the, 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 the new um, President, or whatever they call him in Israel? I don't know. I don't know if it's referring to an individual or not, but I think it's referring to a, a time of peace. There's going to be a conquering that occurs that's going to bring about a peace. Okay? So, what kind of conquering? I don't know. But I know that the victory, I know that the conquering is not going to come based upon themselves. It's going to be, based, be given to them from above. How do I know that? Because, A, that's right. A, it's God's plan, and B, the Stephanus is given to him. So, he has given the victor's crown even before it happens so that he can go out and conquer, okay? And so I believe that that's happened that way. The second horse, I'm sorry, in the second seal, we see that he opened the second seal and heard the second living creature saying, come and see, another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. And so we see the horse, he's fiery red, okay? And again, when you picture fiery red, what, what, do, you, what do you picture? Blood, violence, anger, okay, or things that, that come up with us, okay? And so we see that um, the rider on this fiery red horse was granted, A, to take peace from the world, and secondly, he was given a great sword. Now, the same word did me is, is used twice, so he is given the privilege, the, the, the granted there is the, actually the word to give, he was given the, then the privilege to take peace from the earth, and he was given a mega sword, and the word megas in the Greek is where we get our word for large, big, great, so he's given a mega sword, is, is real, literally what, what he's given, you know, and so he's given this, this great sword to go out and to, to do this great damage, this great horrific damage on the earth, okay, now, how does he do it? Note, it's not he who is going to do the killing, but rather he is given the power to take peace from the earth with this great sword, if you would, by people, by people or nations killing one another. Literally, what it says is that, that one another killing themselves, one another killing. And so they're one another killing. They're killing one another. So you can see peoples in a tattlesies. That means it's not there. And so you can apply what it's going to be. I think it's going to be a mindset of anger and hatred toward one another. Why? Um, well, I'll come back to that. That's my, my answer. This is important here because when we talk about the people should kill one another, I, there's so much that goes on here. This is phenomenal because this killing one another is, is really, and so, and so I'm glad I put my slide here so I wouldn't forget this. This word for kill is not the normal Greek word for kill. The normal Greek word for kill, without looking at that, it's one of your, one of your vocab words, Ben. Uh, uh, 
What is it? Epictino. Uh, Epictino. Thanatos is death. Epictino is to kill. That is the normal word for killing. So if you killed somebody, it was apotino. I kill. Epictino. Okay? This is the word, though, sphagzosin. Okay? How do you like that word? Sphagzosin. Okay? It is the word that is used to slaughter an animal specifically for sacrifice. The only time it is not used to refer to an animal that is slaughtered for sacrifice is to Jesus Christ, but he is referred to as the lamb that was slaughtered for sacrifice. And in a couple verses, we're going to get to the fifth seal and where we see the martyrs who are under the, the throne of God and they are slaughtered for the, the testimony of the word. Okay. Now, I find it interesting then Nobody makes a deal with this word. I don't. I mean, everybody just reads right past this thing, and they just talk about this global killing that's going to go on. But it's a big deal to me, because why did John choose to use this word when he uses apotino other places throughout the book of Revelation for normal killing? I feel this word, by the Holy Spirit, is used particularly. So somehow, during this red horse, after the, um, this peace, this victory that's out there, there is going to be this, this killing that goes on, but I think, I could be wrong, that it's, that it's going to have some religious, some sacrificial um, uh, emblem involved. I don't want to read in here right now that these are saints being killed. It's a possibility because of what we see when we get to the fifth seal, okay? I don't want to read it into it, though, from that and say that it is. However, very clearly, there are martyrs. There are people dying, um, being slaughtered. Here's how Bob sees it. The false piece of the white rider will be exposed. And it will end in a slaughter. Nations rising against nations, peoples against peoples. Now you say, now how does that bring in that, that special killing? Anybody ever heard the word jihad? Now, I'm not saying it will be. But you know what? A jihad in any other language is still the same. The Christians had jihads. We just didn't call them jihads. We called them what? Crusades. Crusades. Okay? That's exactly right. Even in the Middle Ages, when they weren't going against the Muslims, Christians did it to Christians. As we were going through this stuff in the Reformation... I, I'm continually trying to remind you as well that what Christians did to Christians, that more Anabaptists were killed by Reformers than by the Catholic Church. We have, it's amazing that we kill one another for the name of Christ all the time. So, is there going to be, though, this uprising by a particular group that will come throughout the world and it will have a sacrificial... Um, tinge to it. I could be wrong here. I don't believe I am. But when Muslims go on a jihad, they see the death of their enemy as a sacrifice to Allah. I see this in here. Could, could I be wrong? Yes. But for Bob... I see something like that in there. Now, whether it's Muslims, whether it's Buddhists, whether it's Christians, quote-unquote, I, I don't know. But I, I can't help but see this word in there and say, okay, it's there for a reason. Otherwise, they would just use Dapakteno and, and they would have talked about all the people dying. We go to the third horse. The third horse is a black horse, we see. It says, I heard the, the third living creature say, come and see. So I looked and behold, a black horse... And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand, and I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil, the oil or the wine. So first thing is we see, a black horse. For us, many times, black is, is symbolic of death, um, symbolic of, 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 of just bad, of, 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 of evil. Um, the, fourth, the fourth horse is going to be pal pale and paler, anyways, sickly, 
And so I don't know whether we chose black here for this reason. But anyways, but in this is a black horse. And we're told that the one who rides on the black horse has a pair of scales in his hand. Now, scales were always a picture for finances. Okay? You would weigh out things. And so remember back then, they would, you know, they would really use gold and silver. They wouldn't just use paper money. Which are, I mean, could you imagine if you had to weigh the paper money and say, well, it's going to have to be so much weight on these things? Well, a $1 bill doesn't weigh any different than a $5 bill, which doesn't weigh any more than a $10 bill. But when they did, say that again? It would be great. Yeah, that's right. It won't be great because we're, we're going to end with this one. And, uh, <laughs> because it will be like that. But in the days when it was by silver and gold and there was really a standard and, and, and you traded commodities, there was scales. And, and God talks a lot in the book of Proverbs about using fair scales, okay, and, and to, to trading these, these out. And so the, the scales were always, they could be used also as a picture of judgment, okay, but really the picture even of judgment was based upon the, 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 the fact of um, the e economics of it all, okay. And so, so this pair of scales in his hands, and so we have this black horse, we have uh, the rider with a pair of scales, and then we see that um, the consequence um, of what's going to happen is that as he goes forth into this, the, with this pair of scales, that we're going to come to this point where there's going to be a quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil of the wine. Now, you need to know that a denarius was a common laborer's daily wages, okay? So it was a daily wage. And so what's happening here is it says a quarter of wheat for a day's wage, three quarts of barley for a day's wage. Now, this is huge, okay? Because what we're going to see, and so in this picture here, what you've got is on the left side, the field on the left is wheat, and the field on the right is barley. Isn't that kind of fun? I thought that was exciting to find that picture. And so you got your wheat and your barley right there. Now, there's going to be major inflation on the food commodities, okay? A day's wage will only purchase one, quart, one quart of wheat or three quarts of barley. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm a very visual individual. I have to see things to fully understand it. I'm mathematical, so I want to calculate all this. What does that really mean to me? Well, here we go. This is a quart of wheat, okay? So that's a quart of wheat. And so I asked myself the question, and then asked, of course, the person who was going to help me with this, one, my wife. So what does that mean to me? Okay, so I got a quart of grain. Big deal. How does that apply to me? Well, one quart of grain, or at least of soft wheat, okay? Now, this isn't hard wheat. This is soft wheat. There are multiple different types of wheat, okay? This is soft wheat. But a quart of soft wheat ground up will make approximately two quarts of wheat flour. It's not quite four, four cups. You can see that's just a little bit below, but it's over three cups. So it's somewhere between the three and four cups each. Okay? It takes three cups of flour to make a loaf of bread. So these would each really represent what? A large, a large loaf of bread, but a loaf of bread. So during those days, a day's wage will buy two loaves of bread. Two loaves of bread. Now you say to yourself, well, what does that mean? Okay. So we've got one quart of wheat produces approximately two quarts of flour. And on July 24th, 2009, that's coming up in about a month and a half, the minimum wage is going to raise in the United States. Now, now again, I'm taking this into the United States application. Of course, you've got to realize that this is worldwide. Okay. So... But our minimum wage will be $7.25. That means a day's wage on July 24, 2009 will be $60 a day. That's a day's wage. So that means that if those days occurred right now, or at least a month and a half from now, the two loaves of bread would cost you $60. Would you agree that that's major inflation? Right now, you can go to the store, and you can buy bread for anywhere, if it's on sale, from 69 cents to $3.69. Depends on what kind of you want to get. But nowhere close does it get to $30. Right now, um, 
I don't have, do I have that down? No. I don't have it there. Um, the Bread Beckers. Um, the Bread Beckers is a, is a major distributor of, of whole grains and stuff like that. Right now, a, um, a six-gallon bucket of grain, of, of hard wheat, sells for $37 for six gallons. Okay? Um, a, a bushel of wheat right now is going for $5.41. Not by the bread beckers, but that's the, um, the, the, the trading. That's as of 1.30 on Friday afternoon that wheat was trading for $5.41 a bushel, which is eight gallons. Okay, there's a lot of market when you go to sell it. Anyways, but you can buy that. If you want to have it for your house, you can buy six gallons of, of hard wheat for $37. And so you break that down to those, those six gallons down into the cords, and you're going to realize it's only a, like a buck and a half something, I'm trying to figure out what I figured it out. It's very cheap right now um, for wheat, okay, to buy it on by yourself and to make it. And so you think of it just a humongous, humongous inflation that's going there's going to be. And so, um, so in the end, there's going to be um, a great um, inflation. But secondly, we see that there's going to be this greater divide in financial classes. How do I know that? Well, because while the wheat and the barley are on the rise, okay, we're told not to touch the oil in the wine. Oil and wine are luxuries. Anything with an oil. Now, I, I think petroleum is, is involved in here, but I think it's as well, like virgin oil as well, um, olive oil and that stuff as well. But I think predominantly we're going to see that this is going to wind up being petroleum, that kind of oil. Because when a major inflation hits, when everything boils down to it, do you care more whether you got food on the table or gas in your car? Food on your table. Isn't it amazing? When, 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 when this financial earthquake hits, people aren't going to be worried about whether they got Nike, Reebok, um, LA Gear, whatever else on their feet. They're going to be worrying about whether they got a slice of bread for their kids. And the divide between the haves and the have-nots is going to become even more devastating. Because those who have the money will flow through. Now, I'm not preaching health and wealth and prosperity theology here, okay? It's just a fact that those who have money at that time will act as though this is just a bump in the road. Because if you've got a million dollars, what's $60 for a loaf of bread? Right? I'm sitting here with a day's wage as a, as a common laborer trying to get a loaf of bread for 30 bucks, and there's only enough for me or you, and so you offer the supplier 50 bucks for that loaf of bread. Who gets the bread? The guy offering 50 bucks. And so this is the, this is what is being portrayed in this period of time. Now there's one other little piece of information that is a tidbit, just if you want to know this, I wanted to know it. And that is, why is it a quart of wheat for a day's wages and three quarts of barley? I mean, why isn't it a quart of barley? It probably didn't bother you at all, but I wanted to know. And what's the difference? Well, barley, um, interestingly right now, barley sells cheaper than, than wheat does. Okay? But um, two-thirds of the world's barley production right now, approximately two-thirds of the world's barley production right now, goes toward animal feed. Isn't that interesting? The other third, does anybody know where it goes? Beer. Beer. Distilleries. Making beer, wine, or not wine, but um, um, spirits and stuff like that. So it goes into dis distilleries. It really, it's interesting, malts and stuff like that. And so the only, I mean, we really, humans rarely use barley as a, uh, as a food source. But barley actually fills you up more 
and gives you more protein of some of the stuff that, that's good for you than wheat. Now, I don't like barley a whole lot. I'd rather have wheat. However, this is something I want to keep in my mind, just in case I happen to be here during this time, you know? You know, the three quarts, the three quarts of barley is a good deal, you know? I mean, it, it'll go further than the wheat. I might even eat green beans in those, in those days, you know? So, so, amen, brother. So, but the, this is something for we, we just need to know, okay? Again, if I'm going to be here, I need to know it. If I'm not going to be here, it's not a big deal. But I want to pass it on. It's knowledge, okay? There's going to be all this devastation that's going on here, okay? There must be a severe famine and or severe inflation caused by an economic collapse, okay? Could you imagine... If we had a huge economic collapse, and at the same time we had the economic collapse, we had the drought that we've had over the last seven years. Could you imagine if you had the dust bowl? We would be back to the 1920s and 1930s, to the Great Depression. Even if there's an economic collapse, many people aren't going to be able to do what? To farm. But if you add even a lack of rain on top of that, um, supply and demand is the words I'm going for here. Supply and demand. And so if you have tremendous inflation and you've got tremendous supply and demand going on, it means it spells devastation for, for us who are on the lower class. Okay. Now, the fourth, the fourth seal. Okay. It says, we opened up the fourth seal, and I heard the voice of the four living creatures saying, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, in the name of him who sat on it was death. And Hades followed him, and power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with a sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. Now, you'll notice on each of these, um, I put as a backdrop the color of the horse. I don't know if you noticed that or not. There was, for the white horse, there was a white background. For the red horse, there was a red background. For the black horse, a black one. For now, we have the pale horse. I have a what background? Green. Do you know why? Because the word here for pale is really the word for green. It's a green horse. It's a Clorox horse. Like chlorophyll and uh, chlorosynthesis. And so the idea is if you see a green horse, a greenish horse, it's what? It's sickly. Okay? And that's the picture that's going on here. So I didn't want to, you know, I don't want to just keep going on and talking about the pale stuff and just, you know, because it's not just pale, it's green. It's sick looking. It's, 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 you know, I mean, if you see somebody and they're green, other than all complex like I am, but if I was really green looking, you'd say what? Bob, you don't, you don't look good right now. Okay? And so if you ever saw a green horse, you'd say what? It doesn't look good. Okay? So anyways, so we have this, this pale horse or green horse. Okay? And the rider of this pale horse, it says the name of the rider, we're giving a name here. And notice, really isn't the name of an individual. Again, it's a concept. Okay? It's an event. And the, the, it's death. And Hades followed him. And this rider was given the power to to um, kill a fourth of the earth. Okay? And so that gets into the consequence then of the rider as well because he's given this power. And the consequence is that at this time, a fourth of the earth is going to die with sword, hunger, death, or beast of the earth. Now, think about what we've seen. We've got the white horse. We've got this, this victorious rider. Okay? Whether it's an individual, whether it's a nation, whether it's a, um, a political entity, whether it's a concept, there is this victory of, of overcoming that's going to happen on the world, right? And, and it's going to bring this false peace, this, this peace that's out there, which the red horse is going to expose. And the rider and the red horse is going to come and he's going to, he's going to bring all this, this slaughtering, this religious killing um, for sacrificial killing that's going to go on. Um, and, and, and people are going to kill one another. So however that, and that's going to bring about this war is going to bring about this financial turmoil on our earth. Okay, where there's going to be all of a sudden this quarter wheat for a day's wages. And uh, for you guys, this is a quarter wheat. So that's going to cost sixty dollars. 
but a quart of wheat will make you two quarts of flour, which is two loaves of bread. So two loaves of bread for 60 bucks. But as of July 24th, 2009, minimum wage is still below that right now. But it'll go up in a month and a half. So anyways, so, so we have this great devastation, right? Now, what do you think is going to happen? Okay? You've got all this, this devastation that's going on. The world's in great turmoil now. It costs 60 bucks, according to now. It won't be then, okay? But anyways, for right now, it's happening right now. $60 just to buy two loaves of bread, okay? What do you think the United States economy, now I understand this is worldwide, but we're bringing it into applications right here. What do you think it would look like? I wouldn't want to be near a big city. You wouldn't want to be near a big city. Why? Because a bunch of people are going to be looting, rioting, and killing. That's exactly right. There's going to be looting, there's going to be rioting, there's going to be killing. For what? Right. Not for Reeboks? Right. Not for Air Jordans? No. Oh, come on. I mean, I mean, I, you're going to die from L.A. gear, aren't you? I mean, it, this is what it's all about. I mean, it's what shoes you're going to wear, what, what name brand clothes you're going to wear. No, in those days, it's going to be killing for bread. That's exactly right. I don't, and, think, it, I don't think it'll be just the big cities. Oh, it's not going to be. just. Gonna be, but it's going to be worse around the big cities. It's going to be worse around the big cities. And more people. More people if, you, if you live out in the suburbs, whatever, you can plant a garden. But you know what's going to happen? People are going to be coming out to loot your gardens, and people are going to have to protect their gardens. There's going to be mayhem, and my mind is going, when there's a lack of uh, order. Anarchy. Anarchy is the word I'm looking for. Anarchy. There's going to be anarchy. Anarchy. All over the world. It's going to happen. And so, all this is going to go on, and it's now note how it says that a fourth of the earth is going to be killed by the sword, okay, which means that it, that is the picture, the sword is the picture of authority, okay, so that they're going to be, um, again, the, the authority figures that are going to be coming down and killing as well, okay. Um, also symbolic in that probably is just um, weapons of war, which could be guns to us and such, but I think that the sword, for me right there, is more of a picture of, the authorities, that there's going to be this mayhem, there's going to be this anarchy, this, and this rioting and stuff that's going to go on. And so what, what happens when all that goes on? What do governments do? They seek to control, control clamp down, and they, and by, they do that by doing what? Killing. Killing. Okay? Think Tiananmen Square. Okay? Um, and we like to think we're not like that, but we are like that. We are very close to that. In, 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 Mom and Dad, you know this, and kids, you know this just from your own anger. You don't necessarily have the position, but one day you'll be a parent. How easy it is, and what we have to do to, to keep ourselves from exerting influence by force to, to get your subjects to do what you want them to do. Okay? Just now, put that on a, a, a nationalistic scale. You know, that all of a sudden you're losing control nationally. Fortunately, we've really never have fully felt the effects of this. We have had microcosms of it in the United States, but not to the national scale that other nations have. Okay? But the things that we've seen in Argentina, the things that we've seen in some of these other lands, we'll see here in the United States. I don't think that the United States is going to be oblivious to, to some of these things that are going to go on. You know, we sit in our ivory castle and we think we're, 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 we're um, not going to see any of this stuff, but it's not going to happen. From hunger... Starvation. People are going to die like a third world country. Now, this could be third world countries. It's not going to affect us here in the United States. Because think about it. Remember I said, again, the, the day's wages thing is what? Based off of our economy. Our economy is stronger than most But our economy is, right now it is. Right now it is, okay? But we have trillions of dollars in debt. And our three greatest enemies are the ones that we owe. Deuteronomy. Chapter 29, 30, I think 28, 29, and 30, read it sometime, where it talks about being the head and not the tail. Well, we're the tail and not the head. We're now the, the one who is owing and not the lender. It's an amazing thing. And so when Russia, China, and Saudi Arabia call in the debt, what are we going to do? We're, we're going to print money, which causes the great inflation, which causes your bread now to go to 60 bucks. Isn't it amazing? We sit there, we, so we... Maybe it is. Oh, you know, all of a sudden, the United States goes from being a world leader 
to a third world country with a lot of big toys that can't be used. It's an amazing stuff. So anyways, so with hunger, people are going to die from starvation because you can't get the bread. The big guy says, I'll pay $50 for the bread. With death. This is, huh? Death? Well, that's Apatino. That's the Thanatos. That's the, that's the normal death. People are going to die. But that makes sense because they're going to be malnourished. Okay? And they're not going to die just from hunger, but they're going to die from other things. Cancer is still going to be out there. But now all of a sudden you're not going to be able to what? Afford all the, the, tra- the, the treatments and everything else. Okay? So things that you normally would go and seek to have treatments, you kind of have to do it. And by, get this last one, by beasts of the earth. I think that's literal. Why do you think the beasts of the earth? Because people are going to be starving and weak. Because people are going to be looking for food, and so are animals. Your domesticated puppy still wants to eat. And we have a lot of semi-undomesticated puppies that are out there. For your first thing to eat. <laughs> no, that's exactly right. Tojo. Anyways, just, you know, get the grill going. And so, but, um, ah, sorry about that. I hope Pete is not around. Anyways, um, so, but the reality is that we're going to have to be careful. In those days, what do you picture right here? I picture mayhem. I, I, I picture total mayhem of, of chaos in the world. Um, anarchy, people trying to just survive. So, global financial collapse, ensuing starvation will lead to unparalleled global death. People dying from starvation and being killed by others and beasts that are seeking food. Now, this is an interesting fact here. According to the CIA, and yes, I was at the CIA's website, according to the CIA, the, the world population in July 2008 was estimated to be 6,706,993,152. Using that statistic, then approximately... 1.7 billion people will die during that, that one seal. 1.7 billion people will die because of the economic collapse. It's amazing to me when I look at, and this is not meant to be a political message, I don't want to have us lose our non-profit status here. Anyways, so... Um, However, applicationally here, it is amazing to me when I see leaders of our country put off the devastation to the, to the days of my children and my grandchildren. It's like the kings of Israel and Judah, who when the prophet came and said, um, Thus saith the Lord is what's going to happen. And the king, if, if the king heard that it wasn't going to happen in his lifetime, but it would happen in his kid's lifetime, he said, oh, good. Praise God. <laughs> well, that's what the Lord wills, and that's what the Lord wills. Rather than getting on his face and repenting because of the calamity that he's causing his children, it's as long as I don't see it, it's okay. And I wonder how many of us adults are living like that today. We can pick on the government but how are we living? Are we doing the exact same thing? Do we really care about what we're leaving for our kids and our grandkids? Anyways, somebody's kids and somebody's grandkids are going to live through this day. And if it happens in my lifetime, I think I'm going to live through that day. And it's not going to be a pretty day. But let's go on to the fifth seal quickly here. The fifth seal, we're told that when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to each of them. And it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed, slaughtered as they was complete, was completed. Actually, that's the word at the end, be killed. Um, that's actually the word up at Taino. The word up above, slain, is, the, is our word spak, so, um, for slaughter. And so here, in this seal, we see the, the martyrs, 
who are going to die. And we're told, first of all, that they are under the altar. Now, their location being under the altar, what does that mean? What's the altar? First of all, I see it as the altar of Christ's sacrifice. Everything on the earth the, um, in the temple was a picture of that which was in heaven. Jesus Christ is ultimately our sin sacrifice. And his sacrifice was, was presented upon the, the altar. And so I see this as an altar of burnt, burnt offerings. And that we are under that altar because we are under the, the blood of Jesus Christ. We are, we are there by the blood of Jesus Christ, by his sacrifice. But I see it, secondly, I see it in a dual role here. I do see it as well as the altar of their sacrifice. Because just as the lamb was slain, remember, we talked about this word for slaughtering as a religious sacrifice. We're told that these are the souls who had been slain, had been spiritually sacrificed, if you would, as well. And so these are the souls who are the ones who have been sacrificed. In Psalm 37, it's a great psalm, but in the midst of the psalm, when it's talking about trusting in the Lord and all those kind of things, it tells us a little bit more about why. And it says... The wicked plots against the just and gnashes at him with his teeth. The Lord laughs at him, for he sees that his day is coming. The wicked have drawn the sword and have bent their bow to cast down the poor and needy, to slay. Okay, and guess what the word is in the Greek? That's our word for slaughtering, for a, 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 a um, sacrifice. To slay those who are of an upright conduct. Interesting. Because I went into the Old Testament in the Septuagint. The Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Okay? So because, again, the, the Jews, during the days of Jesus, were Hellenized. And so they didn't know Hebrew, but they knew Greek. And so they translated the Old Testament into the Greek so that the Jews back then could have it. And so a great resource of understanding some of the New Testament uh, Greek words is to go back into Septuagint to see how it was used. And interesting enough, this word, spaxo, is used for all the times of an animal being sacrificed as well, slaughtered for a sacrifice. Okay, Avoteno is used for murder and for killing, but Svaxo. And so this is the word, again, for having a slaughter, for having a sacrifice. Isn't it interesting that whenever a righteous man dies because of righteousness, it's considered as a, a sacrifice. And so we're told that these, these ones would die as well. And so in Matthew 5, verse 11 and 12, Jesus in the Beatitude says, Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil things against you, falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And I ask you, how did they persecute the prophets? They killed them. So, we see these ones then who have been slain, for the word of God, for the testimony which they held, what was the reason that they were killed? For their belief. Because they held to the word of God. Now I think that word here should be capitalized. Because I think it refers to Jesus Christ. They died for Jesus Christ. They died for the word of God. Now I think there's a, a dual application there. It's also that you're dying for what? The Bible. I think there's going to be a day that comes when people are going to, they're going to say to you, turn it in, burn it. We've already started to do that as a nation. And you know the news reports from just a week and a half, two and a half weeks ago, where a church sent cases of Bibles over to, to, to Afghanistan. And it angered the Afghani people. It angered the, the, the Muslims that were there. And so the United States government, instead of returning the Bibles to the sender burnt them. The rationale being that if they sent them back to the church, the church would find another vehicle to send them into the nation and use them. So our United States government burnt cases of Bibles because they did not want them distributed. That's a huge huge step to me. It's surprising that that's not more vocalized. It's surprising it's not more vocalized. The news news isn't going to vocalize that. No way. I agree with it. 
That's exactly right. They, a, they agree with it, but it's Romans chapter 1. They suppress the truth because they're not thankful and they choose to worship the creation rather than the creator. You hadn't even heard about it. See? Yeah, it was a church that sent it over to a, a, mil, a military guy, a soldier. And, and so the government decided to burn them. Burn them. So, anyways, people, it's going to be happening. You know, if, if you if you will not, if you if you believe in a literal interpretation of the Bible and you believe the Bible is the absolute uh, truth, you'll die for that. And so we'll ask the question in a moment, but, you know, for me, you've got to make the decision right now what you believe. The days are coming, it may be in your lifetime, when you might have to make that decision. You can pray that it's not in your day, but it may be in your day. And for the testimony, which they held. And I ask you then, what's your testimony? Do you have one? Do you proclaim it? Do people even know it? Look, these people are dying because of their what? Their testimony. What's your testimony? Not that you sin, but that Jesus saved you. What you say, yes, I'm sorry, what you say. You're a witness. And actually, actually interesting, the word martyr comes from, most of you probably know this, comes from the Greek word martyreo, which is where we get our word martyr, right? So martyr, martyreo. And the word martyreo, martyreo is, the, is a judicial term as for a witness. It's the witness on the stand. You're giving a factual testimony. And so these martyrs, if you would, these ones who are dying, are dying for their witness, if you would, even potentially then on a stand. When they are asked, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ? That Do you believe that he is God? And you say, yes, that means guillotine. So, okay, yeah, Steve. I was going to ask, ask you, do you think it'll, it'll go back to the days of you know, being burned and hung and yes. beheaded? Yes, 100%. Or, or by today's standards? When we get shot, no, I think they'll probably use guillotines and all that kind of stuff. I mean, when the world, I mean, no, I don't think it'll be humane. I think when the world goes their way, they do the things their way, and and they will want you to be. There will be despots and stuff that that go, and they will want you to be a um, an example for others. And, say again. I didn't hear you. In an arena, may even be in an arena. Yeah, I mean, think about some of the games that, that we're doing and people are watching on TV today. Some of this ultimate contact and ultimate combat stuff were, I mean, just bloody stuff. I mean, I, don't, I, mean, I hear about it, but I've never seen it. But, I mean, things are, are really getting to this gladiator stuff where we, we you know, in this um, uh, reality TV stuff where we're in people's houses and, um, and all that. Just, anyways, it's nuts, though, where we're going with all this. It is. It is coming full circle. We we have not read Gibbon's book, The Rise and the Fall of the Roman Empire. We 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 will repeat history for sure. And it's interesting. Gibbons wasn't even a believer. You know, when he wrote The Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire, he he was not. And he still well, he's a believer now. But anyways, everybody down there isn't a believer. They know what the truth is. It's just too late. Anyways, in their cry, the cry of these these saints, of these souls, and it says, How long, O holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? They're crying for God's vengeance to, to, to defend them. Listen, we've died, and, and it doesn't look like you have done anything because of that. But God says to them what? Relax. Don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. You guys rest. Have your peace. Because there's still a period of time to come where others are going to die. Right? And so we're, we're told... In Romans chapter 12, verse 19, it says, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. So, just remember, as those days that come, and even as partially we see some of that, you know, the, it's kind of like a birth pains. You know, I mean, you, women still have the same pains, they're just not as intense when they go through the birthing process. You know, the, 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 the muscles are starting to clamp, just not as intensely to push the baby forward, but it's starting the process. And so, before we get into these days, there will be the birth pains. Remember, we, we saw that as we're going through the book of Thessalonians. So, you can expect there to be undulation, if you would, 
occurring before the great undulations. And so what am I saying by that? Well, I fully expect that before these days that we will begin to see greater and greater persecution, a cleansing of the church, where those who are his will have to make the decision to, to live like it and declare it. But in those days, I shouldn't get mad and I shouldn't be crying out for vengeance because whose vengeance ultimately belong to? God. And what you really declare is whether you believe that God will do what he said that he'll do. And so in that passage that we're not showing here, but rather that we're told to love our enemies in that passage, it heaps coals of fire upon their head. You know, it's an amazing thing. On the back of Matt's car is a, is a bumper sticker that was left by the, the previous owner, and it says, forgive your enemies. Do you remember how it ends now? Nothing annoys them more. Forgive your enemies. Nothing annoys them more. <laughs> Not quite the right motivation. Anyways, but <laughs> definitely a biblical statement we're supposed to forgive our enemies, but it's not just so I can heap coals of fire upon their head, but it is a fact that it does. Okay? And secondly, Revelation 19, verse 2 says, For true and righteous are his, that is Christ's judgments, because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication, and he has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. There is coming a day when God will repay those who will persecute those who are his. I don't have to worry about that. But what I do have to worry about is, am I spiritually prepared for the end time struggles? I like to think, I would like to believe that the Tim LaHaye's and the David Jeremiah's are right. And that the tribulation, that the rapture of the church is going to happen at Revelation 4, 1. I don't see it there. I don't see any of the indicators there. And so, if that's the case, then I have to understand that there is a great potential for me. Now, I know I won't be there in Revelation 11, because that's the seven years for Israel, right? We saw that in the book of Daniel. I won't be there. But chapter 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10... Clearly come before chapter 11. Would you agree with that? I think you would. Okay, so, so if that's the case, okay, and I have an idea. When we get to later on, you'll see where I think the rapture might be occurring. But if it doesn't happen at 4.1, that means there's a potential for me to be going through some of these seal judgments and some of these trump, trumpet judgments. And if that's the case, then I have to ask myself the question, am I ready? to experience some of this turmoil that's going on. Listen, believers in other countries experience this stuff today. United States, we have been um, sheltered, thank you, that's the right word, sheltered from a lot of this, and we just don't get it. Believers around the world pray for us because we're, we're, we are that lukewarm church. We haven't had to make a decision of who we're going to follow. We, we want to follow both sides of the fence. And they, and they pray for us because they know that, that our, our, our um, affluence has, has made us lose our focus. But when those days come and two loaves of wheat or two loaves of bread cost 60 bucks, all of a sudden we're going to be praying for our daily bread once again, not just our daily steak. Are you willing to be a martyr for the word of God? in the testimony of his salvation. And that's a question I ask myself, and I ask you, not just for the future, but even right now. A martyr is someone who suffers for what they believe. Now, I'm not saying to go out there and look for suffering. But the other side is, are you willing to make the statement that you know at that moment you need to make? Even though it may cost you a friendship. It may cost you a job. It may cost you money. It may cost you a deal. What do you are you willing to exchange Jesus Christ for? If we don't learn now to stand firm, why do we think we will when our very lives are on the line? If I'm not willing to lose a friendship, 
why would I be willing to lose my life? If I'm not willing to lose a job, why would I be willing to lose my life? If I'm not willing to lose a deal, why would I be willing to lose my life? If we believe that this is what God has called his saints to do in the future, why would it be any different for me today? Why is God's standard that I can just blow off and live the life like I want to live it? But the saints in that day, now they're going to be called to be real believers. I don't think the standard's different. I think it's my application of the standard that's different. And it's Bob that needs to change. It's Bob who needs to repent. Who needs to change the way he thinks. And needs to be convicted and conf committed to the name of Jesus Christ and to the testimony of Jesus Christ in this day. Not just because I may live in those days. But because that's what he's called me to do. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for you. I thank you for your grace and your mercy. Lord, I know there is great devastation that is going to come upon this earth. And you have not um, sheltered believers around the world from it. There are many believers who pray clearly for their daily bread. Who pray for your protection that they may worship you. Clearly I take it all for granted. I take my cars, the travel, my home, the computer, the software, the internet, TV, the food I eat, to even go home today and to grill out and have a deck to sit on and go inside and get out of the heat into the air conditioning. I take it all for granted, Father. I am so lackadaisical in my faith, the living out of my faith. Forgive me for that. And yet, Lord, I know being a man of unclean lips, I live among a people of unclean lips. And so I ask for a revival in my own life and in the life of this little body, this little assembly. Lord, we want to see us grow. We want to see us um, see your word, see your kingdom expand. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be those who are committed to, to applying what we learn. Lord, that we would be truly like cities that are set upon a hill whose light cannot be hid. And help us, Lord, to be willing to, to offer our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto you, which is our reasonable act of worship, and not to be conformed to the world, but being transformed in the renewing of our mind that we may be able to prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. In your bowl